Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to talk about data cleanup and why it is so important. No matter whether you're doing a Six Sigma project or a data analytics project, you don't get the data in the ideal format. So you always have to go about cleaning it. What are the common issues with the data? You may have data which contains outliers, missing values, scaling issues, or multicollinearity. Now, if these are new terms for you, don't worry, we're going to have a look at them one by one. But before we get started, it will be a good idea to subscribe to this channel and hit the bell icon and please share it with all those who might benefit. Let's get started. So the first is outliers. What are outliers? For a given variable, outliers are extreme values which are significantly different from the rest of the data. When I say a given variable, I mean to say a column. Typically in your data, your variables are the columns and rows are the observations. Now let's have a look at this data. We have three columns. We have a health score, we have the age of the participant, and we have the number of steps walked by the individual each day. Let's look at the first column called score. In this column, do you observe there's one value which is a little different from the others? 760. Why it's a little different? Because if you see, rest of the values are ranging anywhere between 350 to 500. But they seems to be a little higher compared to the other values. So is the case with the column age. We have a value here, but this time the value seems to be much smaller compared to the other values. We have the age somewhere ranging between 25 to 37. But there's one particular value, which is 15 seems much lower compared to the rest of the values. Let's look at the column steps. Here we seem to have values which are at the lower end as well as the upper end. So we have a value of 2500, which is the smallest value, and we have another value which is 18,000, which is much higher compared to the rest of the values. The remaining values all range between 9,000 to 15,000, but this is still not concrete. We've seen some values which look different, but how do we know if these are actually outliers or not? To figure out if a given variable or a given column in your data contains outliers, let's look at these box plus one by one for each of these columns. For the first column that score, if I do a plot, you see that there is an upper end outlier and you can see the scale, this value is 760. For the second column, which is age, if we look at the box plot, this has a lower end outlier, so that's 15. And the column called steps, if you see, it had both kind of outliers. So box plot is the most convenient way to visualize if you have outliers, but that still leaves a question, how do we decide that a given value is outlier? For example, in this case, why 15,000 is not an outlier, why 18,000 is an outlier? So, of course, there has to be some kind of boundary beyond which the values are called outliers. And how do we identify these boundaries? Typically, if a given value is greater than Q3 plus 1.5 times Q3 minus Q1, or if a given value is less than Q1 minus 1.5 times Q3 minus Q1. Now, what are these Q3s, Q1s, and uh, what is this Q3 minus Q1? We've done this in one of our earlier videos, but just to quickly refresh in your mind, Q1 is the 25th percentile, Q3 is the 75th percentile, and Q3 minus Q1 is known as the interquartile range. So it's the middle 50% of the data. Now that we've discussed that there is a way to determine if a given column in our data contains outliers or not, there are a few top queries that people always ask, and I've on purpose included them in this video. First is, are the outliers always bad? Well, the answer is not really. For example, in our case, the data we were looking at, we had an outlier in the column called health score. And the measurement in that particular column was happening on the scale of 800. So higher the value, the better it is in terms of health. Now, a value of 760, which was called an outlier there, was not actually a bad value at all. That's a good health score. In fact, somebody must be doing something really extraordinary to attain that score, right? So outliers are not always bad. Second is, are the outliers incorrect entries? 
they may be incorrect entries. For example, you had a column called age. Let's say an age there would have been something like 155. Now you know that human beings don't survive for 155 years. So that's definitely an incorrect entry. It could be an error or a fraud in certain cases, but it is not always an incorrect entry. For example, in our case, the value was 15. So 15 might not be the right age group to participate in that kind of study, but it is not that 15 is not an age that people attain, right? Why do we give them so much importance? Now, outliers are given a lot of importance because in the presence of outliers, we can't work with most common summary measures, which are mean and standard deviation. Because if you look at the formula for the mean, it gets influenced by the presence of outliers. Once again, we have discussed this at length in our measures of central tendency video. I'll leave the link in the description. Second is standard deviation. Why is standard deviation a problem? We know about mean. Realize that standard deviation uses mean in its formula. So when you have mean being used and mean itself is influenced by the outliers, standard deviation also gets influenced. Commonly, if somebody asks you about your data, how do you talk about your data? You talk about the averages, right? So you may replace the mean with the median, but what about the spread of the data? For the spread of the data, the most popular measure is standard deviation. In Six Sigma, we talk about putting six standard deviations between the mean and a given value to be able to generate a Six Sigma process. So you can imagine if your mean itself is corrupt, your standard deviation will not be correct and you can't proceed any further. And that's why outliers in the data are not such a good idea. The second issue, missing values. We're looking at the data and the data is like this. So what changed? Of course, we got some missing values. It's very simple. We don't have the data, but we have a concern with this. And what's the concern? What's wrong with this? First of all, missing values leave the records incomplete. If you look at the example here, and if we assume that every single row represents an individual, you'd realize that for someone, you don't know how many steps the person walks. For someone, you don't know what's the health score. And for someone, you don't know what the age is, right? And all these are critical pieces of information. So your record is incomplete. Not only this, there are a number of machine learning techniques which can't tolerate missing values. They simply won't proceed with the data that's full of missing values. So we'll have to find our way through it. Third is scale, and we'll spend some time to understand this a little better. Now, if you look at this data, we have the score that's being measured in hundreds. Age, which is being measured in tens, it's mostly a double digit and steps which are mostly being measured in thousands. If I visualize the same data all together, the three columns on a box plot, this is how it looks like. Now I'm sure you will be a little concerned looking at these two red boxes here. What's wrong with them? The problem is that the scale while visualizing the plots is chosen as per the variable with the largest magnitude. In this case, that's steps. Its magnitude was always in thousands. Score and age, which we individually looked at some time back while discussing outliers, had proper box plots, which are not even visible here. And why is that so? Because their scale was very limited. Score was below 800 all the times, that was the maximum possible value, and age was ranging between 15 to say a 37. Now that's the reason these values are so small compared to the values taken by steps that these box plots have almost been compressed to straight lines here. Let's understand what does it mean mathematically. So here's our data and for demonstration purposes, let's just take the first two rows and try to calculate the distance between the first two observations of our data. So going by the most common form of distance calculation between the two points, x1, y1, and x2, y2, we know that the distance d between these two points as per the Euclidean distance is calculated as d squared, the squared distance is equal to x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared. And if you have three columns, that simply extends to one more variable that will be z1 minus z2 squared. Let's consider doing this calculation for the first two observations. And if you put the values, this is how it looks like. 
Let's simplify this further and further. So now you see that the variable which has its scale in thousands is the most dominating variable here. When I look at the distance at the end of this calculation, this is going to be the most dominating variable. Why? Because if you look at the order, it is almost 2.25 million. Compared to that, a nine attributed by age and a 10,000 that's attributed by score is barely going to matter. So in such cases, when your variables are on different scales, the one with higher magnitude will often dominate in most of the calculations. Now let's try to look at the same data in a different way. So we have the first column, which is score. But we're saying that now we will measure it in percentages. And how do we do that? Divide it by the, the maximum allowed score, which is 800 in this case. Same way we can convert the age into months. And how do we do that? Simply multiply it by 12. Same way we can divide these steps by 100 and start measuring it as per 100 steps. So now when you do a comparison, Onto the left, you have a table, which is the transform table. And onto the right, you have the original data. What has changed? Just some time back, we discussed that higher the magnitude, higher is the relative importance given to the variable. As per the table on the left, can we say that age now becomes the most important variable because it attains the highest magnitude, followed by steps, followed by score. Now, when we look at the table on the right, as seen earlier, steps happens to be the most important variable because it's being measured in thousands, followed by the variable that's measured in hundreds, followed by age. So now you see there is a problem due to the scale. You're not able to figure out which variable is relatively more important. Therefore, we can conclude that scale is influenced by the units of measurement, which might give pseudo importance or false importance two variables. And that's why it is important to bring the variables on the same scale. The last is multicollinearity. And if you recollect, we discussed it at length in our video on the principal component analysis. We explored the idea of why it is good to have a correlation between your dependent variable and the independent variables, but it is not such a good idea when you have correlations between two or more independent variables. We deliberated on this idea in a little more detailed way in the last video on principal component analysis. I'll leave the link in the description. You may simply watch that again. But just to summarize what's wrong with multicollinearity, multicollinearity adds a redundancy to our models. As we end up using variables which do not add value in terms of predictive power. Before we end this video, I would like to leave you with a thought. Do you think it is important that these concerns like outliers, missing values, scaling issues, and multicollinearity should be treated in a certain order? Is the order of treatment important or you can just randomly treat any of these? We're going to talk about some of the most popular ways to clean up data in our subsequent videos. In case you've not already subscribed, you may consider doing that now. As I always say, when you share knowledge, it multiplies. Thank you.